Hi everyone, Dave here and welcome back to the complete guide for every F1 game ever, part 7. And today I present to you F1 2000 for the PlayStation 1. Okay, any fans of the PS Luden rules, I can tell you that you can actually customise the grid. So you could have a reverse grid race. This game was developed by Visual Sciences, the same team who made Formula 1 98. Now, as everybody knows, that game was a little bit of a disaster, but this time they had the full backing of the EA Sports brand, and also the associate producer of Formula 1 97 was also brought on board, a Mr. Pete Smith, and his contribution to this game cannot go unnoticed. So, just coming around the first corner now, as you can see, it said I had maximum assists on, which means it's also braking for me as well, but it's just a quick race. And I'm just going past some of the Minardis there. The graphics in this game look very, very good indeed. They're not brilliant, I have to say. There's a lot of polygon tearing and quite a bit of uh, graphical glitches. But overall, oh my god, I've just taken off a frost. I do apologise. That was my bad. But overall, the graphics are a huge step up, of course, from their last game, of course, which was Formula 1 98. But also, you do happen to see some of the liveries go into Lego blocks, just like the previous game unfortunately but overall it's a significant improvement and just shows what can be achieved when some money is pumped into a game especially from the big brand of EA Sports. Okay so I suppose you could call this the arcade mode there is no actual arcade mode in this game this is just quick race which chucks you straight into the action with a four lap race starting from the back of the grid oh my goodness did you just see that the AI are fantastic in this game. They react not only to you, but to the other cars on the circuit. Okay, let's have a look now at a trailer from the EA Sports brand, showing their commitment to be the best in 2000. Sports. It's in the game. Okay, so let's look at the options. Of course, let's get straight into some of the settings. Once again, you can reconfigure your controller, and once again, it's fully compatible with the analog steering, acceleration, and brake. Fantastic news. And also, you can have some sound options where you can adjust the sound. If it's too loud or too quiet, you can have it louder. Screen alignment, of course moves the screen from the left to the right which was very common on the PS1 because for a SCART socket it used to chuck the display off the left hand side and you could have the on screen display either on or off and you could have the aspect ratio either on wide or 4 by 3 which was very handy at the time. Okay then we go into the weekend now we're just going to do a race as normal in Monaco we're going to drive as Eddie Irvine now and let's first go through some of the options we can change the driver. So let's go through the drivers in F1 2000. Of course, we could have Mika Hakkinen or we could have David Coulthard in the McLaren, Michael Schumacher or Ruby Barrichello in the Ferrari, and Jordan, Heinz Harald Frensen or Jarno Trulli. On to Jaguar, and it was Johnny Herbert or Eddie Irvine. Williams was Ralph Schumacher or Jensen Button. Then on to Benetton, Giancarlo Fisichella or Alexander Wurtz. Our next team is Prost with John Alacy or Nick Heidfeld. Then on to Sauber with Pedro Diniz or Mika Salo. The next team we could drive for was Arrows with Pedro Dolorosa or Jos Verstappen. The next team was Manardi with Mark Genet and Gaston Mazzacane. And finally, BAR, Jack Villeneuve and Ricardo Zonta. 
Okay, we're going to pick Joss Verstappen. There is a reason for that, which I'll explain a little bit further on. We can drive in Melbourne in F1 2000, Interlagos in Brazil, Imola at San Marino, Silverstone, which was brought forward early for 2000, Barcelona in Spain, the Nürburgring in Europe, Monaco, of course, at Monaco, Montreal, we could drive in Canada, Magni Coors in France, the A1 ring at Austria, the Hockenheim ring at Germany, the Hungara ring in Hungary, Spa in Belgium, Monza in Italy, the Indianapolis Grand Prix in America, the Japanese Grand Prix in Suzuka, and the Malaysian Grand Prix at Sipang. Okay, let's look down now at some of the other options we can have. We can look at the weather forecast for the race weekend and see what it's like. As you can see here at Monaco, it's nice and dry and sunny. We can look at the fuel strategy. You can go for one stop, two stops, or even three stops. And I can confirm that even on a 16 lap race, all the cars stop once. You can have your tires on soft or hard as well. Okay then, let's have a look now at some of the other options. You can have dry weather, wet weather, or realistic weather. You can have the laps, it's default at 16, but you can go right the way down to four laps. And then it goes up to eight laps, 16 laps, uh, half laps, and then the full race distance. You can have the difficulty, which is default to medium at easy, medium, hard, or expert. You can have the fuel usage as on or off. You can have the flags on or off. The tire wear, of course, on or off off, the failures on or off, and lastly the damage on or off. Okay, let's go to the car setup screen now and see some of the settings that you can adjust on your car. Uh, there's the front downforce, which you can see is on very low. You can set it to high for circuits like Monaco. And on the right, you can see the sliders actually adjust up and down to tell you what effect that has on your car. Of course, with the downforce on high, you have reduced speed in your car so that's for the front and rear downforce you can adjust the gear ratios as well down to low for a circuit like Monaco or high for a circuit like Monza you can also adjust the steering lock from its middle position up to full steering lock which is very handy for a circuit like Monaco where you've got that really tight hairpin turn in the casino section and you can adjust the front suspension and the rear suspension as well and also the brake balance from the rear uh, if you want it further forward because you're locking up on the brakes you can adjust all those settings from the car setup screen you can also adjust the ride height for circuits that are pretty flat or increase it for circuits with more undulation okay now it's time to go over to Jim to the Rosenthal street circuit in Monte Carlo home of the Monaco Grand Prix now let's see the grid positions for today's race. On pole, Michael Schumacher in the leading Ferrari. Second place, Mika Hakkinen. Third place, Coulthard. Fourth place, Villeneuve. Fifth place, Heinz Harald Frentz. Okay, so once more it's time for our Monaco test of the five lights class. It's time to say go, 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 as Murray Walker would say. But unfortunately, Murray Walker is not in this game because he was licensed to the Sony Formula One games. As I've just gone straight into the back of Ronaldi, oh my goodness, I am actually showing you the beautiful cockpit displayed on this game. Let's go to the first corner and see what happens. Well, as you can also see, some of the liveries are going into Lego, just like the previous game from Visual Sciences. Anyway, let's have a look at the replay now. All you have to do in this game is tap the triangle button and it gives you a 10 second replay of what's happened in the race. Fantastic. This game was like a breath of fresh air after the once again disappointment of Formula 1 99 with its very imprecise steering and of course its collision detection which was frankly laughable. Uh, so yes, this was a real step up. And also I think for the very, very first time you could actually play this game at the start of the season and not as the season is just coming to a close. Yes, because this game was released in March of 2000. It was supposed to release on the same weekend as the first Grand Prix. Oh God, getting very, very tired as we come into the casino section now. 
in the glorious cockpit view mode which is pretty tricky to get to grips with it has to be said but once you uh, get used to it it's pretty much the view that you'll stick with because it is absolutely glorious it's a very very low down view though as you can see very low down indeed as we go to the replay as we come into the casino section Anyway, unfortunately it missed its deadline by one week. There had already been one Grand Prix on the television before this game came out one week later. But it was pretty impressive that it managed to come out almost at the start of the 2000 season. Now, there is a reason why I picked Jos Verstappen's car for this demonstration. People who are already up on Formula 1 will notice that this is not the correct livery for the 2000 season. And that is because very late into the start of the season... Arrow signed a deal with Orange, the telephone uh, communications provider, and they then became the main sponsor for 2000. But unfortunately, this game was so far in its development cycle, and the deal was only signed six weeks before the start of the season, that it could not be incorporated into the game. So hence, this is still last year's livery for the Arrow. This is also one of the reasons why just six months later EA released F1 Championship Season to try to address some of the things they couldn't implement into the game as I've just ploughed straight into the back of a Jordan. I think it was Jarno Trolley and I've got wing damage which means I'm going to have to come into the pits. Yes, so F1 Championship Season was released six months later. Let's have a look now at some of the other views. You've got some of the chase views there and the nose cam view and then back to the copy view. There's only, I think, about four or five views in this game. And this view, of course, is one where you can't see the car and it's almost impossible to be able to get around the circuit. So anyway, we go back to the chase view now and it's time to come into the pit stop. So as we come into the pitch, you can see it's just a statistic screen which tells us exactly what's going to happen. We've got the strategy on there. The tyres are going to be uh, refreshed. The fuel is going to be refreshed, which only took about a second there. But the repairs are going to take an enormous amount of time because of putting on a new front wing. As you can see, we're going to go into the 22nd territory of this pit stop, which is frankly unheard of these days in the modern Formula 1, even with a wing change. It never takes that long. Anyway, up to 20 seconds, I do believe. Yes. And now it's time to say go, go, go. So that's the pit stop. There's no actual crew that comes out. But look at this. Here's a throwback to F197. And of course, Pete Smith's contribution. There's stickers on the tyres, just like in F197, which told you that you're on brand new rubber. Fantastic. Okay, so it wasn't all good news. There was heavy criticism at the time of release that this game was too easy. And it has to be said that criticism was justified because you could quite easily win a championship in a Minardi. Uh, this was one of the other reasons that F1 Championship season was released six months later to try to address that. But unfortunately, Dave found out that they did that by cheating. And I will tell you when I get to F1 Championship exactly how they managed to address the difficulty level on this game. We've just gone to Canada now, as you can see, we're just going around, just showing you one of the other circuits. I've started from the back. Now, unfortunately, Jensen Button, who of course was in his first year in Formula One in the Williams, always seems to start from the back of the field in this game for some very, very strange reason. His teammates are always well up there in about eighth, sixth, fifth, something like that, but Jensen always starts from the back. Okay then, so is this game compatible with the PlayStation 3? Yes, it's about 80%, oh my god, compatible. Um, if you're looking at any slowdown, well that was actually in the game. But on the menu screens, unfortunately, it's very, very laggy. Oh my god, we've got a yellow flag and a car has exploded. Yes, it's got a full damage model in this game and other cars can actually blow up. Which is fantastic news, but look at that, I braked really hard. I didn't manage to stop in time for the yellows and I've got a stop and go penalty so I'm gonna have to come into the pits now and serve my stop and go anyway as I was saying yes the menu screens are very very laggy and the background music actually constantly skips on the PS3 but the actual game itself runs no problem so I would say it's about 80% compatible now of course we're just coming in now for our stop and go penalty because we've been very very naughty and we deserve a slap and we come out now after that and rejoin the field obviously in last place. So is this game worth buying? Well I will say yes, yes, yes. Uh, you can pick it up for about a pound at eBay or Amazon. And this is the pause menu. You can just adjust a few effects. You can have the racing line on or off or the driving aids on or off. And yes, I would say absolutely. If you look elsewhere on my channel, I actually did a career mode on this game with Heinz Harold Frenson. 
and it was great fun indeed and I was actually qualifying properly uh, I think I was only using default setups so uh, you can gain a huge advantage from using your own setup in this game even though it is fairly easy and it was great fun the pit stops work and the AI actually reacts to what is going on around them thanks so much for watching everyone this has been my review of F1 2000 for the PlayStation 1 there will be more later